Tough, durable, smart, Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore is not, as his rivals have discovered, a man to mess around with. But his track record is such that when he expresses his opinions, which he does with a bluntness that is uncharacteristic in this part of the world, everyone, including Washington, pays attention. Prime Minister Lee joins us now live from Singapore. Richard Nixon's credentials as an anti-communist are long-standing and unquestioned, but it was President Nixon who re-established a more cordial relationship to China with his visit to Beijing in 1972. And Mr. Nixon joins us live now from New York. President Nixon, when you expressed that rather pessimistic view a number of years back that America was in danger of becoming a pitiful, helpless giant, premature pessimism? I believe that as we heard the first part of this program, we would say, yes, it was. But I think it's important when we talk about the domino system and that game of dominoes that we think of it in terms of what dominoes is on the international scene rather than just in the parlor when we play it. It's true that dominoes, uh, when we normally play the game, one falls and the others fall in order. But when we speak of dominoes internationally, when a domino falls in one part of the world, it affects through reverberation, dominoes in other parts of the world as well. Let me put it more precisely. Uh, in addition to Cambodia and Laos, which have fallen, uh, we have a situation where, as a result of what happened in Vietnam, uh, the American defeat there and withdrawal, uh, the victory by the communists, uh, that the Soviet Union was emboldened, and the United States, in terms of its policies, was discouraged. And around the world, in Angola, Mozambique, Ethiopia, Nicaragua, the dominoes fell. And I say that was a direct result of the failure in Vietnam. Now, having said, right. that, how, having said that, I do want to point out, however, that I'm delighted that in the first part of this program, we saw how well those nations are doing in Southeast Asia and in Korea. That shows that those who chose freedom are doing very well. They're richer. Those who and had whatever. communism imposed upon them are much poorer. I, I want to go to Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore for a moment to focus on the very positive nature of what's happened in this region of the world over the past 10 years in particular and ask you, Prime Minister Lee, whether if we're going to focus on the negative outfall of what happened in Vietnam, you could draw our attention to the positive outfall. Was there any fallout, rather? Well, nobody could have predicted how it's actually turned out because nobody could have foreseen that the trends would have been so abruptly discontinued. Up till Vietnam, up till South Vietnam's capture, the communist bloc looked solid. And the underlying thesis for their expansionism was that they would eat away at the edges. After Vietnam, they fell out. Not only had China and the Soviet Union had a rift, the, South, the Vietnamese decided to flout Chinese views and interests and attacked Cambodia and got themselves locked in a long struggle now with China. So the whole picture altered. The rules of the game, so to speak, their game of eating up little chunks of the world, they themselves changed. And we profited. Fortuitously, they brought about a situation where they were snarled in. And whilst they are frittering away their resources in more conflict and war, the rest of Southeast Asia zooming away. More trade, more investments, more growth better homes, better life, better jobs. Let me focus this with you for a moment, uh, on, if, if, if I may, Prime Minister, let me focus with you for a moment on the question of China. It was, after all, as I mentioned at the, at the top of the broadcast, the fear of Chinese expansionism that drew America into this region in the first place. Are we being prematurely optimistic about China's role in this region? Uh, one cannot say what will happen after, say, 20, 30, 40 years when China has become a modern, strong power. But let me point out that that fear of China 15, 20 years ago 
that led to the policy of containment was not altogether unfounded. China, under Mao Zedong and Zhou Enlai in the 1950s and 60s, was an evangelistic communist power. And the Indonesian government firmly believes that it was China that helped instigate the communist coup that failed in 1965. So the idea of, uh, of a strong communist bloc in Asia with China as a motivating force to expand its borders was not all that ridiculous. That they President have been Nixon. thwarted. Sorry. Go ahead, That sir. they have been thwarted. Thought. President Nixon, you spoke of the, the far-reaching negative effects of the Vietnam War. Find for us, if you can, whatever far-reaching positive effects there may be from what's been happening here in Asia over the last 10 years. Is that having an effect in other parts of the world, too? I would say, first, the example of what has happened in Asia is one uh, that uh, creates very positive results in the other parts of the world because it proves that Freedom, in the broadest sense, wor works. Uh, and as other nations try to find a way uh, to more progress and the rest, they look at what has happened in Asia, and to a certain extent, they will want to do likewise. I would also point this out, that when we look at the situation as far as the Southeast Asian countries are concerned, and Korea, we have to think of what would have happened had the United States not taken a stand in Vietnam. We have to realize that, for example, when I was there in 1953, I first visited all those countries. Uh, they were all just coming out of colonialism except for Thailand. Uh, they were all poor, uh, and they were all looking for a quick way to have progress. And many people, uh, not just those who might be communists, but many well-intentioned people uh, looked at the Chinese example and said, maybe this is the best way. Now, as a result of the United States and South Vietnam holding the line in Vietnam all those years, it bought time for the countries of Singapore, Malaysia, the Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, to move forward as they have. And I think that is a very positive result of a very difficult war for the United States and for the people of South Vietnam. All right, gentlemen, we're going to take a brief break. We'll be back in just a moment with Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore and former President Nixon. Joining us once again, live from New York, former President Richard Nixon. And joining us from his residence in Singapore, the Prime Minister of that country, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew. Prime Minister Lee, we've spent a great deal of the last 20 or 30 years analyzing this part of the world. I wonder if you'd do us the favor of turning that around. You've been a, an observer of events in the United States for many years, and a keen one at that. Too much of a preoccupation with Vietnam over the past 10 years? No, no. Too much preoccupation with declining American uh, will to assert herself, uh, to perform as she used to perform, and fortunately for us, a recovery in the last uh, four and a quarter years since uh, uh, President Reagan of some of the uh, confidence and elan that used to characterize American administrations before the debacle in Vietnam. It may seem like uh, a very decent, I mean, a, a, a rather distant series of events, however, uh, when we talk about Central America, but the analogy between Vietnam and Central America is constantly being made in the United States. Do you consider it a valid one? Uh, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that foreign wars, however small, if they are long drawn out and uh, they're carried back to the United States on TV, uh, means the total involvement of the American people. And therefore, it's got to be sharp, decisive, and conclusive. No, in that this is not uh, Southeast Asia. The uh, Nicaraguans are not Vietnamese, uh, either in numbers or in uh, the culture. And 
being much nearer home, I would have thought much more relevant to America's uh, immediate strategic interests. And when uh, critics of our policies in Central America these days warn against the kind of involvement in Central America that might lead to another Vietnam, you would say what to them? Well, I heard Mr. George Ball on radio last night in some uh, program which you, Mr. Couple, also took part. And uh, I felt that he was very wise, but unduly wise. I mean, can we really predict history uh, the way we extrapolate one event into another? Is history done the way it's written up? Uh, nobody writing up the history of Vietnam of the last 30, 40 years since 1945 could have predicted the outcome. Because it's not just what the Vietnamese do, but it's what the Vietnamese do in the context of a changing world and how that world perceives its interests and either checkmates or facilitates Vietnamese ambitions. Uh, I do not know about Central America, the people, the cultures, <coughs> the uh, underlying thrusts of history there, but I do not believe it is profitable for Americans to be so obsessed about failure in Vietnam as to become paralyzed from what must require American attention and initiative and is, if necessary uh, I wouldn't say intervention but some action to prevent a gradual erosion of America's strength America's stability uh, America's assets in the region but I don't want uh, I don't want to lose that train of thought I just want to uh, take this momentary break to warn our affiliates that we're going to be running a little bit over again tonight and turn immediately to President Nixon and ask you Mr. President what it is in the context and with all the memory of Vietnam and with particular reference to the point that Prime Minister Lee made just a few moments ago namely that as we look back we could not possibly have predicted what came out after the Vietnam War what are your views on what we ought to be doing in Central America and if you will draw an analogy if you think it's appropriate to Vietnam well it's, it's interesting to note that in the debate over El Salvador aid to the government of El Salvador when it was under attack and is under attack from uh, communist uh, guerrillas uh, and now in the debate over aid, whether or not we aid the Contras the anti-communist against the communist government Nicaragua over and over again we hear the refrain, refrain uh, no more Vietnams. We must not have El Salvador be another Vietnam. We must not have Nicaragua be another Vietnam. The way to avoid that is not to make the mistake we made in Vietnam. That is to provide in El Salvador uh, enough aid, arms and training and so forth uh, to combat the aid being provided by Soviet bloc to the guerrillas. And then the people of El Salvador, as they presently demonstrated, will be able to contain it. And insofar as Nicaragua is concerned, the way to avoid Americans having to be committed to Nicaragua is to provide aid now to the anti-communist guerrillas who are willing to risk their lives against a repressive communist government. If we provide enough aid for them, that government will be kept busy enough within its own borders that it won't make trouble with its neighbors and it will discourage also the Soviet Union from putting another base there. Putting it very bluntly, with, it's, be with it's far you... better to provide that aid now to the Congress uh, than to have Americans have to go in later and remove a Soviet base. Mr. President, with all due respect, you remember history as well as I do. You remember it better than I do because you lived it. That is how we began in Vietnam. We began, first of all, by underwriting the French effort. We began then under President Eisenhower when you were vice president in giving certain modest aid to the South Vietnamese to help themselves. It didn't work. It didn't work because what happened was that due to the, the fact that the United States was involved in the murder of Diem, a major Vietnam leader, a strong one, with faults, but a strong one, that from that time on, the United States had to take over uh, the responsibility of fighting the war itself. And then as the war went on, 
uh, as we all recall, uh, once we had the peace agreement in 1973, that then, instead of providing, continuing to provide as much aid to the government of South Vietnam as the Soviet Union was providing to the North Vietnamese, as a result of that failure, two years thereafter, the Soviet tanks rolled into Saigon. What I am saying here is that we can avoid having a commitment of American forces in Nicaragua, for example, if we provide adequate assistance to Nicaraguans willing to fight the current communist government. That's President the way to Nixon, keep Americans do you, out. Do you really believe that if we had continued to give aid to the South Vietnamese, even if we had been able to resume bombing over the North, do you really believe that the eventual outcome would have been any different? I do. Uh, I believe that we underestimate the ability and the will of the South Vietnamese to fight. We have to remember uh, that the last American uh, left Vietnam, American combat uh, uh, troops left Vietnam on, in uh, April of 1973. For two years thereafter, the South Vietnamese did not lose the provincial capital. It was only after they lost the support uh, that they needed in terms of arms and fuel and so forth that they were overrun. No, I, I know that many disagree with that, but I believe that with proper support and with the threat that the United States would resume bombing if the North Vietnamese broke the peace agreement, which we should have done, I think under those circumstances they could have, it, we could have uh, sustained them. I must tell you, and we're coming rapidly, I'm afraid, to the end of our time, but I must tell you that a couple of, of the top Vietnamese leaders, the foreign minister, Le Duc Tho, both told me they did not take that threat seriously because they knew that the United States could never again, uh, and forget about Watergate and forget about the, the congressional edicts against getting involved again, that the United States could never again and would never again become as involved in Vietnam as it had before. And they said, if you couldn't defeat us before, what makes you think you could defeat us without that kind of aid? Your reaction to that, sir? Well, I would think that that's exactly what they would say at the present time. Uh, but I think we also have to understand when we talk about whether or not we want Nicaragua or El Salvador, for that matter, to become another Vietnam, we have to understand the consequences. Uh, I think we're all aware of what happened in Vietnam as a result of our failure. Uh, two million people killed in Cambodia, uh, 600,000 at least people drowned in the South China Sea trying to escape from Vietnam. In fact, more people were killed in communist peace than in the anti-communist war in Vietnam. Now that's what we were trying to avoid. And I think as we look at Nicaragua today, we have to well understand that in the event that we fail there, uh, the flood of refugees that will come into this country, the consequences there in terms of the effect on our friends and allies in the area will be catastrophic. All right, Prime Minister Lee, just a quick closing thought from you, if you would, on the Vietnam legacy. It's happened. It could be, it could have been somewhat better. It could have been a lot worse. We are grateful that it's turned out the way it has, and we've got to be extremely careful that the Vietnamese do not, as a result of their treaty of friendship and cooperation with the Soviet Union signed in 19. 78, before they invaded Cambodia, do not get away with the spoils of that Treaty of Friendship and Cooperation, or we'll be in for a very difficult period. And we should note... Go ahead, sir. And we should note also that right at the present time, uh, the leader of the communist government Nick of Nicaragua is in Moscow uh, negotiating an agreement for economic aid and I assume military aid as well. Uh, that's where the parallel exists, and that's why we must avoid another Vietnam in Nicaragua, and it can be done without putting in any American forces. Gentlemen, I'm very grateful to both of you for joining us. Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore, thank you, sir. President Nixon, thank you.